Uh, so you should look at both of those lectures. Both of those lectures are from a previous semester, but the uh, life history theory hasn't changed in the intervening year, um, so they should still uh, work. I do want to make some points about that material, um, just to sort of make sure I drive that point home. Uh, I'm going to assume that nobody's watched those videos, right, that you have no idea what's going on in those. Um, so we'll do just a bit of review to get you up to speed, and then it's your responsibility to go back and look at those. Uh, and then I want to talk about ethograms and life histories, because for a lab, I want to start doing um, some, what I think is pretty cool stuff uh, for lab material. Um, and uh, then there's going to be a midterm exam. Uh, if you go click on this uh, first midterm exam, that's not your midterm exam. Uh, but it's going to take you to a page that looks like this. It's going to be your first exam. I recommend uh, that you look at this exam to sort of get a sense. Um, when that window comes up, you need to block, you need to allow it. Uh, you're going to, there's a countdown timer, right? It started in 25 minutes. So you got 25 minutes to complete the exam. Uh, first name, last name, email. Um, and then so on, and then there are going to be some definitions. So we're going to go through all of that material here. Um, we will run through this exam. Uh, you're going to address all of those questions there. I've forgotten how many questions there are, uh, but notice it's all it's all true, false, multiple choice, uh, that kind of stuff. If you're prepared, it won't be a problem. Uh, once it counts down to zero. Anything that was filled in after it hit zero doesn't get counted, OK? Um, the exam also has a um, built into it. It has, uh, I record your IP address, so I'll know what, what, which computer you are uh, using. And I also get your, um, your physical address, so it, it as much as a GPS can pinpoint your location. And so it gets that both on, based on your IP address and on uh, the signal that we're getting uh, from your computer. So we'll know where you are. I mean, you might be at 264, you know, um, Joe Bob Lane, instead of 262 where you really are, but we'll... Why do we do that? So that I can make sure that you're taking it by yourself and you're not there with your best buddy. Why is it limited to 25 minutes? So that I can be sure that you and your best buddy aren't on the phone talking back and forth, you know, going through it together, trying to figure all of that sort of stuff out. I'm trying to make sure that it's you individually that's taking the exam. So far, uh, it's worked really well. Um, so far, I've not had any students um, that have cheated on this sort of exam. And you don't need to if you paid attention to the material you'll do fine. It's, not, it's all pretty straightforward. You've seen that figure before. You've seen all of this stuff before. Um, and I've forgotten how many questions there are. Uh, but 25 minutes is more than sufficient. When you're done, you're just there's a submit button down at the bottom. You're just going to click that submit button, and you are good to go. OK? So you get 25 minutes. Uh, in the past, most students um, that took this version of the exam uh, last year uh, finished it in well under 25 uh, minutes. There were a couple of students that took you know, 24 minutes and 59 seconds and then hit the submit button. Um, but those are the students that are double checking everything, going over each question a couple of times to make sure that they you know, didn't miss anything and that they still agree. Um, so, question. Uh, so, is this going to be available all weekend this week? It'll it'll go live on um, it'll go live on Friday evening. Um, I'm obviously going to put up another one, but it'll be the same basic uh, form. It'll go up on Friday evening. Uh, you can take it any time between when it goes live till midnight on Sunday. So if you do your best work at 4 o'clock in the morning after you've been over at the Pink Pony or something, good. Okay, That's when your mind is focused. Good. Okay, If you do best you know, at uh, 
at noon or right after lunch at one o'clock in the afternoon, you can do that. Okay? We all good? Awesome. All righty. Well, let me uh, close that down like that. Okay, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, life history stuff, and we want to. I want to talk a little bit about uh, ethograms and um, and life histories. Uh, what we're going to do for lab, uh, we're going to do that on campus. Uh, right now, the squirrels should be uh, feeling kind of hungry. Uh, we're going to spend one lab period going outside doing ethograms for squirrels. Um, and then uh, you're going to get a packet of material um, which is provided by a consortium of people from, uh, some of these people are from Purdue, some are from Western Washington University. Uh, one person is from Ohio State, one person from Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Um, but it's this group of people that have developed this module on squirrel behavior um, that we're going to exploit. They have four modules, we're going to use two of their modules. One module is on optimal foraging, we're going to do that one. Another module is going to be on, on behavior, and our interest is going to be on vigilance behavior. Um, so there will be some set data sheets that we're going to work with. We're going to complete those data sheets. We end up submitting those data sheets to that consortium. We'll use our data, and we can use data that's been submitted in the past to address a number of hypotheses that you are going to develop. We will work in small groups, uh, meaning pairs of people. So if there's somebody that you hate and you don't want to work with them, make sure that you don't get stuck with them. Um, if there's somebody that you really would prefer to work with, you know, make arrangements to work with that person. Okay? All right. Uh, let's uh, get started by talking about life histories a little bit. Okay? Um, I'm going to. Um, how would you best do that? Why don't I. down here. we do this. Um, let's, uh, let's make sure we understand um, a couple of key points. When we're talking about life histories, we're talking about it in an evolutionary context. Oh, and I remember this classroom. It's the one that has all the funky markers. Uh, when we're talking about um, life history strategies, we're talking about it in an evolutionary context. Okay, um, so the questions are, when should you reproduce? With whom should you reproduce? How often should you reproduce? How much energy should you invest in reproduction? How much energy should you invest in individual offspring? Okay, so those are the key questions. We want to answer those questions in an evolutionary context. When I say in an evolutionary context, what I really mean is what? What are we really concerned about? We're talking about optimality. If you were a um, business person, you would probably do this sort of stuff all the time. What, what do I mean when I say I want to optimize something? Improving efficiency would be one, one possibility. Make it faster, better. Make it faster, make it better. It depends on what the end result is, okay? If you're a business person and you're trying to optimize, what are you trying to do? 
probably cut costs in some way. You, you're trying to maximize your profits, right? And you can maximize your profits by doing what? How can you how can you improve your profit margin? Let's imagine you own a fast food restaurant. Making it cost less. Making it cost less. So you can pay your employees less. Okay? Or you can buy your meat from a cheaper supplier. Or you can turn down the thermostat in the store. Anything that you can do to reduce your costs, right, is going to improve your profit margin. You could also increase the cost of your burgers. But then at some point, people stop showing up because it's cheaper down the road or whatever. You can pay your employees less, but at some point, the only employees that work for you are the ones that are worthless. And then your profits go down, okay? Or they're so disgruntled, they start stealing food from you or something, okay? So we're trying to optimize. What are we trying to optimize when we're talking about natural history, about our reproduction? What are we trying to optimize? success of the offspring amount. okay so success of the offspring but what is it about the offspring that we really care about the alleles the alleles okay every time you have an offspring that offspring the most important point of that I know you love them and all that kind of stuff but the most important thing is that they have copies of your alleles so as a female, as a woman, every time you produce an offspring, half the alleles in that offspring are yours. The other half of the alleles are the father's. Okay? If you're a guy and you're married to some woman and she has a baby, what proportion of the alleles are yours? Depends. What does it depend on? Whether it's your child. Whether it's your child or not. She knows. She gave birth to the baby. She knows it's hers. Half hers. The male hopes it's his. Pretty sure it's his. It's probably his. Yeah, it's his. Probably. Maybe. But he can't be 100% sure. And that's important. The female knows. Okay? So what you're trying to do when you reproduce is maximize what? Inherent fitness. Inclusive fitness. Okay? So you're trying to maximize the number of copies of your alleles that make it into succeeding generations. Okay? So when we think about when should you reproduce, how often should you reproduce, with whom should you reproduce, how much energy you should invest in reproduction, all of that sort of stuff, when we're talking about those things, right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about inclusive fitness. What, how will these decisions influence our inclusive fitness? Well, let's start off with the first one. Oh, well, so let's begin. So imagine there you are and you say, I love kids, but yeah, no, not out of my body. Okay, don't want anything to do with that childbirth stuff, you know, and plus, I don't want to, I don't want to spend my life living with some guy, okay, rather live alone, do my own thing, fine, okay, you can still win at the game of evolution without ever having kids of your own, how can you do it? Your siblings. Your siblings and your cousins, because every time your brother or your sister has a kid, that sibling, your sister, has half of your alleles. So every time she has a kid, 
that kid has 25% of your alleles. So every time she has four kids, you've made another copy of yourself. Yeah. So, quick question. So, like my dad, uh, he married before my mom. She, he had, uh, so I have a half sister, so that means I have 25% of my alleles in her. So, here's your dad. And he was married to somebody else? Yeah, and my sister was the result. Okay. And then they, that fell apart, and then he married my mom, and then had me. Okay, so she had, so there's 0.5, right? And there's 0.5, so you have that 0.5, so 0.5, and there's 0.5 right there, right? So you have 25%, 0.5 times 0.5, you have 25%. 25% of your alleles are shared with her. Okay, that was all right. Okay. Now, if it's a full set, right, it's 50%. So, you can still cover yourself. You don't want to have kids, fine. Just convince your sibling to have lots, and you're good. Remember, you don't have to play the game of evolution. You don't. You can opt out. There's nobody that's forcing you to play. You say, I don't want to do that. I, don't, I hate kids. I don't want to have anything to do with kids. I want to be a hermit. I want to live by myself. I'm happiest that way. It's all good. That's fine. Because in the end, we're all dead anyway, and it won't make any difference. The planet is going away. Our sun is going to supernova. It's all going to come to an end. It makes no damn difference. Okay? But the fact is that evolution works in this weird way. And the reason we behave the way we do is because we have this long history of natural selection operating on us, causing us to behave in ways that we think are independent in self-determination, and it's not. We're motivated by things, right, that have nothing to do with what's really good for us, the person, and it's really all about our inclusive fitness. Natural selection has got these hormones circulating in your body, making you think about reproduction, making you think about falling in love, making you think about all those sorts of things, developing this urge to have kids and all of that sort of stuff. That's all a consequence of natural selection. You think it's free will nonsense. That's all a consequence of natural selection. Okay? All right, so with that in mind, let's start with the first question. When should you reproduce? Young or old? Should you start reproducing when you're 14? Or should you wait until you're 35? Depends. What does it depend on? Resources. Okay. So, anybody here have a uh, have a mother that's only about fifteen years older than you are? Anybody? So, if you guys are twenty, anybody here have a mother that's still reproductive? Let's put it that way. So all your mothers are post-reproductive. Okay? So your mothers waited before they had you. Okay? What's different about a mother that starts having kids when she's 12? What's the average age of a first-time mother in small-town America? Anybody know? What's the average age of first reproduction for females? Guess. 16. You're exactly right. Small town America, the average age of first reproduction is 16. Worldwide, the average age of first reproduction, 16. Okay? In other words, all you ladies are behind the curve, man. You're getting left behind. 
Everybody else is already popping out babies, and here you are, alone and miserable, sitting in this damn class. Sucks to be you. You could be at home nursing a kid or something. Wouldn't that be great? Watching soap operas or something. Okay. What's different about the girl who has her first baby at 16 versus the woman who has her first baby at 25? What's different? I mean, the younger one is going to have way more opportunities to reproduce. Sure. Who's going to who's going to reproduce with that 16-year-old girl? Yeah, 16-year-old boy, probably. And what kind of a guy is that 16-year-old boy? Junk. He's a, have a good paying job, drive a Mercedes, drive a Beamer, does he? Work at uh, some high high dollar law firm or something, does he? No, he's, uh, he's working at Rhodes 101. So his prospects are, what kind of house they live in? Nice big McMansion up there on the northwest side of Cape or down there on close to the river, south, south Sprig Street somewhere. What kind of a guy is he? You can say it. Probably sell a little on the side. Sell, sell a little crack on the side, yeah. What are his prospects like? Somebody say it. Don't make me do all the talking. What kind of a guy is that? He's a loser, right? He's a loser. He's the bottom of the damn barrel. He's got nothing. He drives a rusted out Pinto if he's got a car at all. Probably gets to most places on a skateboard or something, you know. Um, he's probably got a little, you know, he probably hits the vape shop every now and then, you know, because it's healthier than cigarettes. Okay. All that. I mean, this is a guy, he gets 10 extra bucks together and he goes down to the tattoo parlor and figures out, you know, what he's going to, kind of body art he's going to get on himself or something. This guy is a loser. What's he going to be doing in 10 years? Exactly what he's, being, what he's doing now. What's he going to be doing in 10, 20 years? Probably maximum security prison, you know, up in Illinois or something like that. This guy's got nothing. I don't know, maybe he's a good guy, nice, sweet, working really hard, you know, working two jobs, one at Burger King, one at McDonald's, all that good stuff, to make, bring you home whatever he can, he truly loves you, he truly loves the kid, all that kind of stuff, doing his best, even under those circumstances, middle of his life, he's got nothing. You live in some tiny little run-down mobile home on the edge of town or something like that, and that's as good as you can. How's about the woman that waited until she was 25? She probably found her a good, good She man. went to college, she got a degree, right? She's working at some law firm or some consulting firm or something. Meets some high dollar lawyer, drives a Jag, whatever. He's got a house in the Hamptons, got another one down in Palm Beach, Florida. You know, has a little cottage up in the mountains in Montana or something like that. A different ball game. You go to Cancun, it gets cold in Texas, so you go to Cancun for a couple of days to get out of the ice, okay? A different sort of a deal, right? Now think about their kids. What are the prospects of that kid who's born to a 16-year-old mother? Lower. Not much going on. The kid who's mother is a surgeon and father is a is a you know corporate lawyer that kid's going to end up going to Harvard or Princeton or whatever that's a fundamentally different sort of scenario so should man what if you wait until you're 30 years old to reproduce and then you can probably only do it a couple of times before you die I mean, Biologically, reproduction in females comes to a screaming halt somewhere in the early 40s, mid 40s. Okay? What you haven't accomplished by the time you're 35 is, 
You're not going to be doing much of it after that, okay? So in other words, if you wait, the number of offspring you produce is going to be less. If you start early, start at the age of 16, man, you can pop another one out every year. By the time you are at 36, you might already have 20 kids. So which strategy is better? Having 20 kids in poverty or having one or two kids in a nice upper class kind of a way? Which is better? You guys have no opinion? So here's mom and here's mom and dad. Okay? Single mom living in Watts. You guys know where Watts is? You guys know where Compton is? You ever been to Watts? Watts is the kind of place when you drive through Watts, you make sure the windows are up, make sure you're down low in your damn seat. If it's a yellow light, you just keep going. If it's a red light, depending on who's on the street corner, you just keep going anyway. You do not stop, okay? You just keep going, get onto the other side, and hopefully you're still alive, okay? It's a rough damn place. Makes the south side of Chicago look like a picnic, okay? So there you are, single female, you're 16 years old, living in Watts. Here, you're 30 years old, your guy is 40 years old, something like that. You guys have got nothing but money. Okay? She's in poverty. She starts having kids early on. She's got 12 kids already. Okay? They have one kid. Which is the better strategy? Remember, the objective is to get copies of your alleles into the next generation. Um, obviously the 16-year-old because um, her kids, not only is there more, but they're more likely to also start reproducing young because of the poverty that they're in. There is, there is this phenomenal relationship between age of the mother when she has her first kid and age of her daughters when they have their first kids. They are strongly, positively correlated. So young mothers give birth to daughters that are young mothers. Okay? The problem is, there they are living in Watts. How many of those 12 kids are going to make it to adulthood? Maybe half. Hopefully all of them. <laughs> I guarantee not all of them. Okay? Half of them make it to the age of 18. By 19, okay, so six of them made it to the age of 18. By 19, three of them are in a maximum security prison. By 20, two more have been killed in some drug deal gone bad. So you might have one that makes it. And he's broke, he's poor. So what happens to this kid? It's luxury. Living in Beverly Hills, man, for his 18th birthday, dad bought him a Beamer, you know, full ride to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or something like that. Gets a law degree, ends up clerking for some Supreme Court justice, runs for Senate, becomes a senator, gets cold, goes down to Cancun, you know, whatever. That's who that kid is, okay? So which one is better? They both produce one. gets all bent out of shape about welfare queens. What is a welfare queen? Single mom. Yeah, like Say what? Is that kids, you get money from the government. See, so you get more, the more kids you have, the more welfare you get, right? Easy street, right? 
Yeah, that's a myth that was started by Ronald Reagan when Ronald Reagan. So he had this poster woman for the welfare queen. Okay? And you've all been to some you've all been to Fred's or to Save a Lot or something like that. And you'll see somebody in there and she's wearing all this bling and is driving a catalog. And she's paying for all of her groceries with food stamps or something. You've all met that person, right? So let's think about that. You get more money for every baby you have. Does the additional money you get cover the cost of the baby? Not even close. So with every additional baby you get, you're actually deeper in poverty, not better. Things haven't gotten better, things have gotten worse. So why is it that that black woman is driving around in a Cadillac and she doesn't instead spend her money on a decent house? Why? Different, like, point perspective, like she's focused on the now instead of the future. The house is now? Fuck the car, I'd rather have a decent house than a decent car. And let's be honest, the Cadillac is a piece of shit vehicle, okay? Why isn't she buying a house? The reason she's not buying a house is because she can't get a goddamn loan. The reason she can't get a damn loan is because she walks into the bank and they won't talk to her. And or she wants to buy a house and the way real estate, especially in a place like Cape works, they see the color of your skin and they right away direct you to this neighborhood or that neighborhood regardless of how much money you make. Okay? It's called redlining. They can't get a loan. Not because they don't have a good job, but because of the color of their skin. So if you can't do that, you can go down to Easy Bob's used autos and buy yourself a used Cadillac for reasonably cheap, right? And at least have a little bit of luxury in your life. Think about mice. There are these mice. You can do this sort of interesting comparison. You can look at these rodents. There are some rodents that have just a few offspring every time they reproduce. And they spend a lot of time between offspring, kangaroo rats. They will have maybe three pups a year, and that's it. And when the pups are born, they spend a lot of time in gestation. They spend a lot of time nursing, all of that sort of stuff. They devote a lot of energy to those little, to those little baby kangaroo rats. And compare that with pinion mice. Pinion mice will have about 10 pups every time they reproduce, and they're going to reproduce three to four times a year. They pop the little babies out, they wean them, within three weeks they're on their own, they're done, and those pinion mice are looking for another mate, and they're going to do it again. The average life expectancy of a pinion mouse is six months. They don't even see a full year. Kangaroo rat, average life expectancy, about eight years. Do you see the pattern? These guys live long, don't make a lot of offspring at a time, and invest a lot into the individual offspring. These guys have short lives, popping those little babies out, you know, like rice kernels, boom, 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 just keep popping them out, and they die young. They're not investing a whole lot into any one kid. The same thing is happening up here. The woman on welfare living in Watts, she just keeps popping out babies and doesn't invest hardly anything into any of them because she can. Most of them are going to die. She's going to die young, too. She's not going to make it to 80. This couple... They're going to live a long time, probably live into their 90s. They're just going to have a few kids. The kids are going to go to Harvard, Yale, all kinds of resources invested in those little kids. OK? So the question is why? Which is better? Is this better or is this better? Is this better or is this better? The answer is no. None of them are better. 
that depends on the circumstances. If you take this woman, take away all her money, take away her education, and transplant her into Watts, guess what she does? She does that. You take this woman from Watts, give her a decent job, give her an education, put her in a place in Beverly Hills, suddenly she does this. If you take mice and you put them in an environment that is totally predictable, it's safe and it's predictable, they reproduce less and they invest more energy into each baby they produce. You take the same mouse and put it into an environment that is incredibly unpredictable, dangerous, scary, bad shit happening all the time. They start popping out babies and they invest very little into each. Okay? It's context specific. That's the key. Which one is better? It depends on the conditions that you're in. Humans that are living in poverty behave exactly as they should from an evolutionary point of view. Women living in wealth behave exactly as they should from an evolutionary point of view. This couple lives in security in a very predictable environment. This woman lives in a very unpredictable environment. If things are unpredictable, if you don't know when your life is going to come to an end, start making babies. That's the best strategy. And if you're going to make a lot of them, you're not going to be able to invest a lot into any one of them. But that's okay, because most of them aren't going to make it anyway. Most of them are going to die young. So just keep popping them out, and if you're lucky, one of them is going to make it. Or two. Okay? That's what she does. That's what the pinion mice do. So you can think of pinion mice as being ghetto mice. They live in the woods, they're really nice, they're cute, they're awesome. But they're like ghetto mice, because they don't have many options. These guys are like the Beverly Hills couple. Right? Things are smooth, things are easy, don't have to have very many of them, put a lot of energy into each, probability of survival is very high. Okay? All right. So that answers, when should you reproduce? And the answer is, it depends. How often should you reproduce? It depends. If things are unpredictable, you should reproduce very often. If things are safe and steady, you don't have to reproduce as often. And you can invest more into each offspring. Okay? Now, with whom should you reproduce? What criteria are important? Who should you spend your reproductive capital with. And importantly, this is a decision made by who? Who makes the decision about reproduction? The female. It's female choice. Okay, why is that? Because they gotta deal with it. Yeah, it's not just dealing with, it's an important decision, okay? Because as soon as you're pregnant, you're not going to get pregnant again for nine months at least. Probably closer to 13 months or something, okay? That means as soon as you're pregnant, you've shut off all other reproductive options. You've locked yourself in. How many times can you reproduce in your life as a female? How many kids can you have? Didn't we have that discussion once before? How many babies can you make? If you want it right now, you say, screw school, I'm going to become a baby making machine. You could do that. How many could you make between now and the time it's all over? Yeah, you could, you could probably get 30 in there. Maybe 40. The record is how many? 65, okay? So you, you could get a bunch, okay? How many could a guy get? A bunch more. 
thousands, 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 and thousands, and thousands. Okay? So the decision to reproduce is crucial for the female. It's a high cost decision. This baby's going to occupy your body for nine months and it's going to be a drag on your life for the next 18 years and nine months. Okay? It's a big decision. For the guy, wham bam, thank you ma'am, see you around. He's done, he's gone. He scored. Okay? And he's out, just like that. So for the guy, it's no big deal. That's why it's female choice, because the cost of the decision rests with the female, not with the male. So amongst those available males, which one should you choose? What are the most important criteria? Physical fitness. Okay, physical attributes. So, physical fitness, okay, because that's going to be an indicator of what? Health. Pardon? Health. Health. Okay, so physical fitness is going to be an indicator of health. This person is probably going to live a long, meaning he's going to be around a long time to potentially help me rear these kids. That's one criteria. What else matters? Okay, there are two guys. One guy works at, uh, he's the, the, the graveyard shift manager at Burger King. And the other one is an investment banker up in St. Louis. Which one? Investment banker. Why? Resources. Resources. The guy with the resources is the one who will be able to provide for you and the offspring. The wealthy guy is much more likely to be a good dad than the poor guy. Okay? What else? make me go around the room and say, what do you want in a guy? I don't want a guy. I don't care. Pretend. What it, I'm taking it the wrong way. <laughs> what do you want? Imagine you want a guy. What do you want? Um, kind. So honest. What do you want? Gold Pardon? Gold like I have. What do you want? Uh, loyal. Loyal. said, I want a guy, you know, with big biceps, I want, a, I want a guy with a tight ass, I want a guy, you know, with a good tan, I want a guy with perfect hair, none of that sort of stuff. It's all stuff geared towards quality of the male, all attributes, how is this person going to be able to contribute? Is this person going to stick around? Is this person going to be a good dad? Is this person going to be a good partner? It's those sorts of attributes. If you were to ask the same thing of guys, what would guys say? Big tits, nice ass, nice legs, you know, cute face, good eyes, something like that. It's all going to be physical attributes rather than these sorts of attributes. Okay? Why? 
why the disconnect between what the female is looking for and what the male is. I'm not saying that all guys aren't looking for other kinds of things, but that's what they're going to pay. When a guy sees a woman walking down the street, the first thing he's doing is he's evaluating physical attributes. That's the first thing on his mind. You know that, right? You've been subjected to that. You're aware of that, okay? And you know how unimportant it is. So the female has this important decision to make, this critical decision, and she's concentrating on those things that matter. So she's making a decision that is designed to improve her chances of having high inclusive fitness. Okay, natural selection has favored women that are looking for that stuff. At the same time, natural selection has favored men that are looking at those physical attributes. It's not because they're scumbags. They are the product of natural selection as well. What's best for the male is not what's best for the female. It's in the best interest of the female that she finds a guy that's going to stick around and give all of his resources to her, take care of her, take care of the kids, be honest, truthful, all that good stuff. That's what's in the best interest of the female. That's not what's in the best interest of the male. It's in the best interest of the male to cheat. Because if he's just reproducing with you, his reproductive opportunities are limited. It's in his best interest to keep you happy, keep you on the side, and then go find Juicy Lucy or Foxy Roxy on the side and spend some time with them. Okay? It's in your best interest to spot the damn cheater. And when he cheats, to nail his ass to the wall and make sure you get all his money before you kick his ass out the door. Okay? That's what's in your best interest. And the laws are set up to protect you. Okay? It's in the guy's best interest to be as effective a cheater as he possibly can and to get away with it. He's laughing back there. He doesn't realize how poor his chances are. Because one of the things that natural selection has done, women have this insane ability to spot cheaters. I can walk in the front door of my house, and I'll walk in, my wife will say, stop. She'll go, what the fuck's that? She'll go, what? She'll come over and pick this long blonde hair off my shoulder, and she'll go, this. I have no idea, you know, I, they're insane. Go to a, go to a part, faculty party with my wife, we're coming back, and she turns to me in the car on the way home, she goes, so uh, how long's been Billy Bob banging away at Mary Lou? And I'm going, what? And then two, two weeks later, sure enough, Billy Bob and Mary Lou are an item, you know, and they've been cheating on each other the whole time. So women are good at spotting cheaters, and as a guy, you have no hope of getting away with it. It's not going to happen. You will be found out. But you can't help it, because natural selection is favoring you to do that. Isn't that awesome? It's like this battle going on, this sort of competing systems going on. It's awesome. Battle of the sexes. Yeah, and they win. You lose. There's no hope. Give up. All right. Okay. All right. All right. I think um, you can go through. I, in those lectures, I go through all of that sort of stuff. Um, let's. Yeah, we, we go through all of that sort of stuff. There are a couple of things that I that I want to uh, talk about, um, and this is one of them right here. Um, 
if the x-axis is number of offspring that are produced and uh, the y-axis um, is parental investment, uh, notice what happens. As the number of offspring is produced, um, so here we have this line of isometry right there like that. Notice that the curves are different for males and females. So uh, the female parental investment, um, or the, the female curve looks like this. What the female is attempting to do is optimize the difference between those two curves. So the optimal number of offspring for a female is that much. Because that's the point at which the difference between this line and that curve is greatest. So the optimal female parental investment is going to be right there. She should produce that many offspring. For every new baby she has, her life gets so much more difficult. Having one baby is not the same as having two. Having two makes life much more difficult. Having three makes it even more difficult for the female. For the guy, hey, let's have seven. Let's have eight, right? For the guy, the optimal number of offspring is much higher, okay? Look at the huge difference between, between his investment and his benefit. That's what he's trying to maximize right there. So for the male, it's in the male's best interest to have as many kids as he possibly can, which is different from the female, okay? That's where that conflict comes in. What's good for the female is not what's good for the male. What's good for the male is not what's good for the female. So, having said that, which mating system should we use? What are the mating systems that are available to humans? What do I mean by mating system? Yeah, like the one that we have is monogamy. It's the most common one in the US. Not the only one, but it's the most common. So monogamy is one male, one female. Monogamy. What are the other options? Polygamy. Yeah, so, yeah, there are two kinds of polygamy, right? Poly means many, gammy gametes, right? So there's polygamy, which is female dominated, and polygamy, which is male dominated. So when there is one male and many females, we call that polygyny. Polygyny, okay? And when there's one female, and many males, we call that polyandry. As in androgens, right, male hormones. So polyandry, many males. Now, which is the best mating system? I guess it depends, but... It depends. But, go ahead. Uh, obviously, I feel like the female dominated would produce way more offspring than the male dominated. This one right here? Uh, no. It, this one. Or this one. That one which produces the most possible offspring, but the resources would be thinner, probably. Well, let's think about this. Let's think about who that male is. Let's think about who this male is. And let's think about who each of those males are. So this is a male that has a harem. What kind of males have harems? Rich dudes. Rich guys. The Emir of Kuwait. Okay? The guy with the solid gold toilet seats. Okay? The guy that we did shock and awe for before we bombed the snot out of Iraq, okay? So that guy has harems. There you are, all these guys going, oh yeah, man, that'd be so awesome. This harem full of 
bathing beauties, you know, these felt baits and all that good stuff. Yeah, no. What are those women what are those women like in a harem? Forget about the movies you've watched. What are the women in a harem really like? Can I even? They're trying to like, you know, get the attention of you know. Nah, they're on schedule. What are they like? They're massive. They're huge. It's a sign of wealth. This guy has so much money, he can keep his women huge. They're sitting around, eating bonbons all day. They're massive women. It's a sign of status, it's a sign of wealth. The notion that a woman has to be, you know, like Twiggy or something like that, that's a Western thing. That's not the way it is in the rest of the world. Okay? So those are, don't just rely on your movies. They're big. I mean, big, big. And that guy is filthy rich. He's got solid gold toilet seats. Who's this guy? Not wealthy. Not wealthy. Can we be a little bit more specific about who he is? Where's he hanging out? Probably found him on the street. Yeah, he's, he's hanging out at the Pink Pony when he can scrape together enough money. Okay. Um, he's visiting the hookers and whatnot. That's who the, that guy's the John. Okay. It takes five of these guys to support that one female. These guys are the losers. They're the bottom of the barrel. Okay? And it takes five of them to, to support one female. Now think about the inclusiveness aspect of it. So if she gets pregnant, and there are five of these guys, it's only a 20% chance that it's his. So if she has one kid, 0.2 times 0.25, or 0.2 times 0.5, right, it's like a 10% chance that his alleles have made it into the next generation. Not good. Compared with this guy, he's popping out babies on a regular basis because he's got all these women, he's just cycling through them. First number one, then number two, then number three, he just cycles through them like that. And we're not talking about love and affection and all of that sort of stuff. It's just strictly reproductive business and that's it, okay? So he's popping out babies left and right. So this guy is, in terms of inclusive fitness, is much better off than that guy right there. So why is it in this country, this is the mating system we use? You have a lot of resources. You think he's got a lot of resources? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. But the law says this is the mating system. Why does the law say that? I mean, obviously, they're not following that law in parts of Utah, southern Idaho, and northern Arizona. Yeah. Uh, religion. Yeah, which is the odd part. I mean, the justification that they use is the religious argument. Of course, if you read the Old Testament, then there are very specific rules about who you can take as a wife, how many wives you can have, all of that sort of stuff. So the notion of monogamy is a New Testament thing, not an Old Testament thing. Okay? So there must be more to it than just religion. Why else would we do that? Okay, so why is Bernie Sanders such a popular politician? What does Bernie Sanders get that the Republicans don't? He promises a lot for the common person. He directs himself to the common person saying, like, hey, if you're poor, no matter who you are, what demographic, what like age group or uh, wealth, whether you're on welfare or not, like you deserve like Medicare. He's he's Medicare. he's all about the common man. Bernie Bernie Sanders is all about 
sort of this basic fairness, right? Bernie Sanders is keenly aware of wealth disparity. So what's happened since the 1950s in this country? What was the tax rate on the rich people back in the 1950s when Eisenhower was president? How much did rich people pay in taxes and income taxes? 80%. What do they pay now? What did Donald Trump pay in his taxes? Less than 1%. Oh yeah, he, he had claimed an income of like a billion dollars and paid $750, which is less than I pay, okay? A lot less than I pay. So that's income disparity. So you have what's happened since the 1950s is that the rich have gotten richer and the poor have gotten poor and the middle class is disappearing. And that's what Bernie Sanders understands. He understands that the middle class is a myth. There is no effing middle class. You've got the rich and the poor, and nothing in between. So what's happened is this huge wealth disparity. Forcing this is an attempt to prevent that wealth disparity. Because in reality, what's happening in this country is you're going this versus this. This is what you get when there is incredible wealth disparity. In Kuwait, you have the very rich and the very poor. You have the people with harems. And because there are an equal number of sons and daughters produced, every time some guy has eight wives, that means there are seven guys out there without any. OK? So anytime you have a harem, you necessarily also have this scenario over here. And this disappears. So this thing right here is this kind of myth that we have equality in this country, and that there is no wealth disparity, and that everybody gets one. Which isn't true. OK? All right. Let's talk just very quickly about male aggression. Okay. Males are more likely to get into fights. Males are more likely to go to jail for doing violent things. Why is that? Yeah, you can blame it on your testosterone. You know, testosterone makes you aggressive. But it's actually more than that, right? Why is it that males are more aggressive? Males beat up their wives. Wives don't beat up their husbands. Why do they do that? I'm not saying it's right. It's not, OK? One of the things that women are looking for when they're looking for a partner is this level of aggressiveness. And there's this sort of, you don't want some guy that's physically aggressive. You want some guy that's intellectually aggressive or professionally aggressive, but not physically aggressive, right? Think about, what, who's that football player that body slammed or punched his, his fiance in the elevator in that hotel, was he a, for the Dallas Cowboys or something, then they fired his ass? That, that's happened a bunch of times the last couple of seasons, right, where professional football players have brutalized their wives. Why do they do that? Is there a selective advantage to being aggressive on the part of the male? Absolutely. Because it's the aggressive male that gets the partner. It's the aggressive male that gets the female. Okay? Also protects his offspring. Therefore protecting All that sort of stuff, right? It's not just the testosterone, right? It's all those, uh, the testosterone gives the male more muscle mass, right? Using steroids puts males into steroid rages and all that. So clearly there is this connection. But there's more to it than just that. There is selection for aggressive behavior on the part of the male. 
And you can look at it by this cost-benefit analysis. If this is the cost of aggressiveness right there, that line of isometry, this is the benefit. So being a little bit aggressive gives you this huge increase in benefit. But at some point, the benefit asymptotes out, and the cost just keeps going up. So there is an optimal level of aggression on the part of the male, and it's going to be where that difference between those two curves is greatest. Okay? Too much aggression, it's selected against. Not enough aggression, it's selected for. So natural selection is favoring a certain level of aggression. All right. Okay, let's, uh, oh, let's skip that. I think all of that stuff is covered. Hey. Okay, let's um, shift gears just a little bit. Are there... I mean, a lot of that material um, is going to be covered in these lectures up here. Um, where are we? Uh, in, this, in these um, lectures up here. Uh, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about um, ethograms and um, things of that sort. Uh, let's start by looking at some yellow-bellied marmots. Uh, I think that video is going, he is moving around. Um, this is, uh, I can't even remember where the hell this is. I think this is in southern Utah. Um, we have woodchucks in, in Missouri, right? Uh, woodchucks are in the genus Marmota, um, and this is, uh, and ours is Marmota monax. Uh, this is Marmota flaviventris, so a different uh, species, but the same genus. Uh, the difference between these guys and ours is the... Uh... Oh, yeah, they're blinked. He's still, he's still alive. Okay, good. The difference is that our woodchuck is solitary, so it doesn't live in social groups. These guys live in family groups. Uh, so these guys live in these rock piles, and when they feel threatened or whatever, they dive into the rock piles and so on. But what this guy is doing right now, it's, it's sort of interesting. Um, this is first week of September. Most of the other yellow-bellied marmots have already gone into hibernation, right? And he's not doing that. It's weird that these guys go into hibernation because they're so big. They are really too big to hibernate, but somehow physiologically they manage it. So this guy is now sitting there. He's not out eating. In another couple of days, he's going to go into hibernation, and he's not going to come out of hibernation until May. So September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, nine months, he's going to be hibernating. That means everything in his life has to happen within three months. So he comes out in May, and he's going to feed like crazy, and he's going to reproduce and do all that stuff all within that three month window. And here he is getting ready to go into hibernation and he's just sitting his ass there. You're going, what the hell? Dude, get after it. Bulk up. Eat. Do something. Why the hell is he just sitting there? Pondering the meaning of the cosmos. Composing poems to get him through the long winter. Thinking of that cool rap lyric he just heard going by or something. The hell is this guy doing? Why is he out eating? Let's start with that question. Save energy. Well, his body temperature is higher than the environmental temperature. He's losing energy by sitting there. 
he'd be saving energy if he went underground and just went into hibernation. Why is he eating? Look at all that green stuff out there, man. He could be eating all that stuff. Why doesn't he eat it? It's not his preferred food. He's been eating it all all summer long. And now suddenly he's not. He doesn't want to his digestion takes a lot of energy, so at the moment he's getting ready to go into hibernation, so he doesn't want to fill his belly full. No, he, he wants a full belly. Maybe he's sort of getting on the right track, though. This late in the season, the nutritional value of the food, the vegetation that's out there, is so low, he'll spend more energy eating it than he will extract the nutrients by consuming it. So it's no longer worth the effort. Okay, it's no longer energetically feasible to eat. So why doesn't he just go underground? Why is he sitting there? He doesn't care about art or anything of that sort. He's he's got he's got. He cares about two things in life. What are the two things in life he cares about? Food and reproduction. Calories in, babies out. Right? That's what this guy cares about. So how does that relate to what he's doing here? He's looking for a mate. Yeah, they, he's not going to reproduce this late in the season. They've already done their reproduction thing. He's not going to mate again until spring. I was, I was pretty far away when I filmed this, and you can tell by the fiber. I'll be dead. Look at that shit, man. The hell are they doing? to reproduce and he wants calories in. Can't worry about calories in. Right? So he's doing something now to maximize his potential for reproduction, but it's obviously he's not going to be reproducing now. What the hell is he doing? Maybe he's watching out for predators for his offspring. He's looking out for potential predators. And if he sees a potential predator, he's going to stand up on his back legs and he's going to scream. He's being vigilant. He's going to give out an alarm call. If the fox comes around, the fox is going to get down into these holes and grab these guys and pull them out and kill them. And he wants to give everybody a heads up when the fox comes around. Okay? The hell, the, the hell is that? You guys see that? That was not a marmot. He's ignoring him. He's going, fuck you, man. He's totally ignoring that guy. Oh, got an itch. Damn, please. God damn. Okay, they're being vigilant. So that's a prairie dog. I think this is in Kansas. So this is like a week earlier or something like that. These guys are still going to be active. And what's he doing? Same deal. Same deal. He's being vigilant. Okay, He's still going to feed, um, but this guy is being vigilant. He's just looking out for the bad guys. Uh, the bad guys include snakes, hawks, Foxes, coyotes, people, cattle, lawnmowers. A lot of time. 
I'm just looking around. A little bit of time feeding. Oh, there are two of them there. One head comes up, the other head goes down. Why are they always coming up to look? They're looking for predators, right? Standing up on his hind legs, okay? He's scanning, looking for potential predators. There's no moment of peace, right? These guys are always concerned. What's going to determine the amount of vigilance behavior that they exhibit? How vigilant should they be? Notice what he's doing with his tail. See how he's flicking it, how the tail is held up and he's flip, flicking it around? What the hell does that mean? He's on alert. Yeah, but he's, he's communicating with other prairie dogs. That, that whole movement of that tail, he's giving messages to these other prairie dogs. So these two are related, right? They live in family units. These guys are related to one another. So if they spot a predator, if this one spots a predator, he's going to let out a scream, and everybody else is going to dive down underground, OK? So that's called kin selection. We talked about that. This guy is going to sacrifice his copy of his alleles or her alleles for to save all the copies of alleles that are in her kin. So let's imagine you wanted to understand the vigilance of these animals. So you have the marmots, you have these guys, and you wanted to understand this vigilance behavior. You want to understand under what conditions are they going to be more vigilant. You, perhaps you want to develop some sort of model that predicts how vigilant these animals should be. How would you go about doing that? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to spend a lot of time watching them, understanding exactly what behaviors they're able to display, or what behaviors they typically display. Okay? So you know that this guy is just sitting there on all fours, just staring off into space, being vigilant. There are times when you're going to stand up on two legs, scanning, being vigilant. There are times when they're going to be head down, feeding. There are going to be times when they're flipping the tail around like that. There are going to be times when they're grooming one another. Okay. So what you do when you make up an ethogram is simply make this list of all the behaviors you observe and how long they do the behavior, and what the sequence of behaviors is. You have behaviors that go in sequences as well. right? First you eat, then you clear the table, then you wash the dishes. Okay? Then you go read a book, or read the newspaper, or then you go watch TV, or then you go do something else. Right? There's a very specific sequence. You put your socks on first, and then you put on your shoes. You don't put your shoes on and then your socks on. There is a sequence. So we care about that sequence because understanding that sequence helps us understand what behavior comes next. OK? So when you're making an ethogram, you're making a list with the description of all the behaviors that you observe. OK? And you want to know what that sequence of behaviors is as well. So let's imagine you've created this, this ethogram for the prairie dog. It might have 20 behaviors on it. It might have 500 behaviors. Now, what sorts of things might influence vigilance in these animals? How vigilant should they be? What's the cost of being vigilant? 
What's the benefit to being vigilant? I guess it would probably depend on how many like are in the group or the family. The bigger the group, the less vigilant you have to be. Okay? Because there are more eyes looking around. So that's going to be one thing. What else is going to influence vigilance? Your experience with predators. If you've been noticing a lot of predators or you smell a lot of predators, you're probably going to be more vigilant. What else? So you expect if you see animals that are being really vigilant, your first thought is, well, I'll bet there are lots of predators. There's a lot of danger. But it also might be that it's a small group. What else might influence the amount of vigilance? You ever watch the prairie dogs at the St. Louis Zoo? What would it be like to be a prairie dog in the St. Louis Zoo? Yeah, yeah, you're fat. For one thing, you're fat. The prairie dogs at the St. Louis Zoo are effing huge. Okay? They are all morbidly obese, each and every one of them. They are. They're not just a little bit fat, they're a lot fat. Okay? All right. So what else about those prairie dogs at the St. Louis Zoo? What is their life like? They're protected. They don't have to... Do they know that? Nope. Do they know that? Nope. God damn, I'm hungry. Damn. Holy shit, people all over the damn place. Are they safe? Are they going to get me? How do they view people? Depends on their experience, it is. If you're out there and see those prey dogs and say, hey, Let's see how close I can get to them. And you just walk, and you measure the distance between you and them before they go underground. Will that tell you anything? Let's imagine I find one population, and I get within 100 yards, and they dive underground. And I find another population, and I get within 10 yards before they dive down. Before they dive down. What's different about those two populations? The amount of vigilance, right? In other words, in one scenario, they weren't at all concerned about me until I got much too close. In the other scenario, they were really concerned. Okay? You go to the zoo, you're within five feet of these guys, and they're still feeding. Is that because they view you as not a threat? Or what? What's going on? There's always one of them, at least, that's being vigilant, that's watching. And sometimes they all dive down. But what's different about their experience? Environment. What about the environment? They're exposed to it the whole time. It's no. constant. It's noise, people, movement. They're surrounded by it all. Has anybody ever lived close to a freeway? You move into this house and you're right there on the off-ramp or something, and all day, it's a busy freeway, it's the 405 freeway in, in LA or something, all day long, boom, 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 you know, it's just this constant noise. You've been living there for two months, you don't hear it anymore, okay? The hell is that? Birds chirping, cool. I guess my video came to an end. Why don't you, why do you no longer hear the freeway? Just got used to it. And that's called, what is that called? There's a name for that process. It's habituation, right? You become habituated to the stimulus. So you're tuning out the stimulus. And the same thing has happened to the prairie dogs at the zoo. They've habituated to the presence of people. So they see you, they've gotten used to you, they've habituated to it, they're no longer responding to the stimulus until you climb over the little barrier and are in there with them, and then they're all going crazy, okay? 
But as long as you're on the other side of that barrier, they no longer view you as a they habituated to that stimulus. Okay. So now let's imagine you want to explore patterns of vigilance in squirrels or prairie dogs. What's the cost to being vigilant? You potentially sacrifice your own meals. Energy. Yeah. Energy. Energy. Every moment that you spend being vigilant is a moment that you're not spending eating or securing mates or reproducing. So the cost is it takes time away from all the other important stuff that you need to do like eat and reproduce. So there should be some optimal level of vigilance, should there not? You want to do enough to keep you alive, but you don't want to do too much to prevent you from eating, surviving, and reproducing. So now, let's imagine you go out into the prairie and you're watching prairie dogs and you want to compare two populations. One population that is really big and another population that is really small. And you have the hypothesis that in the really small population there's going to be the amount of vigilance by any animal is going to be higher than in the large population. How are you going to do that? Observe. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to record though? You've made this ethogram. You know what all the behaviors are. Now, how are you going to do it? The time spent, like in each behavior. Okay, you're going to measure the amount of, so how are you going to do that? So you're out there with a video camera and you videotaped 2,000 hours of prairie dogs doing exactly what you saw with that level of excitement. Just chewing grass, looking up, chewing grass, wiggling their tail a little bit. Every now and then a little bit of aloe grooming. And you're going to measure the time. You got 2,000 hours of video to work. Yeah, you're going to go nuts. How could you do it? How do you approach that problem? All right, there are two possible ways you can do it. Okay? One way to do it is called focal animal sampling, and the other way to do it is called scan sampling. In scan sampling, what you do is every 30 seconds or whatever the time interval is, every 20 seconds, you look and you record what the animals are doing. So you just watch them continuously, and every 20 seconds, vigilant. 20 seconds later, that's it. You have a focal animal. 20 seconds later, he's eating. 20 seconds later, mutual grooming. 20 seconds later, vigilant. 20 seconds later, vigilant. 20 seconds later, feeding. So every 20 seconds, you just look and you record what behavior that animal was doing at exactly that time. Okay? And then at the end, all you have to do is look at your little list and say, oh, 15% of the time the animal was being vigilant. 40% of the time the animal was feeding, and so on. And now you can compare one population with another by comparing those percentages. All right? The only problem with that approach is what? Do you put your socks on before you put on your shoes, or do you put your shoes on before you put on your socks? There's a sequence, okay? And if you're sampling just every 20 seconds, you might be missing the sequence. For that reason, there's another possible approach, and that is to watch the animals, you focus on one animal, and you look at exactly what the animal is doing. You say, okay, he's feeding for 45 seconds. 
And then he did mutual grooming for three seconds. And then he did vigilance for a minute and a half. And then he did feeding, feeding for five seconds. And then he did something else for this many seconds. So you make this accurate, complete list of everything he did when. And now what you do is you look at the transitions from one behavior to the next. So you build what's called a transition matrix. When you build a transition matrix, you care about the transition from one behavior to the next behavior. You're then going to build something called a Markov chain. Back in the days before we had satellite imagery and all of that sort of stuff, and the weatherman would get on the television and say, there's a 30% chance of rain tomorrow. How did he make that decision? What he did was he built a Markov chain. So he has this model, and he looks at the transitions from one thing to the next. So if it's raining today, how often does it rain the next day? What are the possibilities? If it rains today, it will either not rain or it will rain. So what's the probability? If it rains today, what's the probability that tomorrow it rains? He computes all of those probabilities and then builds this transition matrix. And then given whatever the starting condition is, he can multiply it times the transition matrix and then say, oh, tomorrow it's a 30% chance of rain. You can do the, exactly the same thing for the prairie dogs. You can look at their behaviors and say, oh, very simple. If he was feeding, what's the probability that it's going to be grooming in five minutes or something? You can apply exactly the same technology. But you take into account that sequence. So that sort of approach is referred to as focal animal sampling, right, where you build a Markov chain. So we have two options. We can do the scan sampling with a focal animal, or we can do strict focal animal sampling, where we then build a transition matrix. So what we're going to do in lab is we're going to go either to Kapaw Park or somewhere on campus or the river campus or something like that, or wherever you would like to do it as part of your study, we're going to develop some hypotheses about vigilance in gray squirrels. Okay, So we want to understand what's driving vigilance in our gray squirrels. Are they more vigilant in the morning than they are in the evening? Are they more vigilant in the spring than they are in the summer? Are they more vigilant in a park setting or are they more vigilant in a downtown setting? Right. Those are the sorts of questions we can ask. And what you have to do is figure out how you're going to answer that question. So are you going to do focal animal sampling or scan sampling? Which do you think is less time consuming? Building the Markov chain or just every 20 seconds observing what the animal is doing? Here's what the data sheets look like. You're going to put in your name, the name of your partner if you're working with somebody, your institution, it's going to be CMO, your email address, okay? uh, latitude, longitude, longitude for where you are. You need UTM coordinates. And that goes into this nationwide database that is being built. Um, then you're going to describe your habitat, whether it's, uh, I can't read those from here on that screen. I can't read it here either. Let's see if I can make it bigger. 
Yeah, so whether you're in a desert grass, desert or grassland, a coniferous forest, deciduous forest, riparian, agricultural, college campus, urban, or other, um, all sorts of different environmental variables, you know, how far away to the nearest building and that sort of stuff. And then date and time, and then for the gray squirrels, we have this list of possible behaviors that they could go through. So, is the animal being vigilant? Is the animal foraging? Is it feeding, but he's alert while feeding? Uh, being social, uh, some other behavior, or not applicable, meaning you don't know, you couldn't see the animal. Then every 20 seconds, you record what the animal is doing. So you just have to circle on the data sheet. So that's a period of five minutes. Every 20 seconds, you get an observation. You're recording what the animal does. So in other words, you're not going to build a Markov model. You're going to do scan sampling with a focal animal. So you're going to pay attention to one animal, and you're going to record what those different behaviors are. All right? And then you're going to record what species it is. The gray squirrel that we have on campus is um, Cyrus carolinensis. How many individuals in the group that you are observing? Okay, we, we can worry about all of that other stuff. Were there humans there? Were there other species there? Other kinds of squirrels, other dogs, cats, whatever, birds flitting around and so on. So those are the data, that's the data sheet that you're going to use. That's the sort of data that is going to be available to you. So now, what question can you address with data in that form? What might influence vigilance? It isn't necessary that you just use gray squirrels. We have thousands of hours of marmots and thousands of hours of prairie dogs. We have other squirrels as well on video. We have Uinta ground squirrels. We have Colombian ground squirrels on video. So there are other possible species. You can look at your own species. There might be chipmunks or something that you're familiar with, or fox squirrels where you live or something. In other words, I'm asking you to start thinking about hypotheses that you could address. What is it that might influence vigilance? What is it that might influence foraging? Alert feeding? Being social? Those sorts of things. What is it that might influence those behaviors? Okay. Habitat might be it. Right? If you're in an urban setting, it might be fundamentally different than if you're in a college campus or in the woods. Species might be different. Prairie dogs might be fundamentally different from marmots. Fox squirrels might be fundamentally different from gray squirrels. Has anybody here ever had experience with fox squirrels? How do fox squirrels differ from gray squirrels? Do you guys know what a fox squirrel is? Anybody? Fox squirrels are the, the really reddish guys, okay? They're bigger, about 200, in, in this area, they're about 200 grams heavier than the gray squirrels. They're bigger, they're bulkier, they're pretty tough, they're pretty badass, okay? The gray squirrels are kind of like little pansies compared to the fox squirrels. All right, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's um, get into groups. How many people do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We have 12. Let's get into groups of two. So uh, first of all, are, they, are there any people that know each other and would prefer to work with a specific person in this class? Nobody knows anybody. You don't care. You two, you two guys want to work together? Okay, anybody else? Or do I need to assign people? You two will work together? Make choices, people. We'll, we'll let, we'll, it's female choice, so we'll let females choose potential partners. 
choose somebody to work with. These two, these two people are working together. You two people, you two want to work together. You two want to work together. Or you're looking at him going, oh, fuck no, not him. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you'd be all right working with him? OK. You two guys? And that means then you with the person in the back. OK? All right, so let's. Uh, what time do we have? We've got five minutes. Um, here's what I want you to do. Maintaining social distancing, okay? Um, exchange critical information and get a few ideas about what you're interested in. So are you interested in vigilance? Are you interested in, in forging behavior? Obviously, we're, as we exit winter, these guys are going to be hungry. They're probably going to do a lot of foraging. Are those data going to look different from what you would expect for animals that have been foraging in the fall, OK? Or in the middle of summer, or something of that sort. We will have, avail we will have available to us data from other locations, other seasons, other habitats, all of that kind of stuff, OK? So develop some basic kind of idea. I'm not asking for formal hypothesis yet, but Meet with your partner, exchange contact information, and start talking just for a few minutes about what sorts of questions you want to address. Go. Okay. I have computer. I've, I'm completely done with it, but it wouldn't let me like screenshot it or anything. Like I have it on my laptop, but it wouldn't let me. You don't. You don't have the snippets tool on your. I, like I print. I hit print screen. Yeah. No. Cast. I use the snippet tool. Okay. So in the search window, just type in snip. Okay. It'll come up with a little snippet icon, and then you can do the screenshot in that way. Okay. And then just save it as a JPEG. Okay. Um, didn't, did we not set a due date? I don't think we did. I didn't look. Really talk about our class. Oh, well, we yeah. obviously didn't, did we? Yeah. I just turned it in. You probably got it. Yeah. Uh, I'll send out a, an e re email reminder or something and ask you guys to turn it in. We're, there's no rush, right? Exchange contact information. Um, my recommendation is you slowly start developing ideas um, for what you can evaluate, right? What sort of hypotheses, what question you want to ask about those schools. We are going to spend, you know, a fair bit of time doing this. We have two of these sorts of things. One is on foraging, the other one is on vigilance. We'll be working on this vigilance stuff for a couple of weeks. Okay? Well, we if if it's nice, we may go out on Wednesday, you know, and start watching squirrels and developing our ethograms. Okay, if it's, the weather's nasty, we won't. If it's nice, we'll be out there. Okay, very good. I will see you guys later. <laughs>